and welcome once again to another presentation in the forum of the Institute of Politics. I'm Dick Thornburg, the director of the IOP, and uh, given the normally stuffy nature of the Harvard boutique, you will note that uh, I and my colleagues are here in our shirt sleeves tonight because of the fact that uh, the university apparently didn't pay the bill for the air conditioning and it's a little bit hot and stuffy. I need to tell you that because you've been sitting here. We're particularly glad to have you here this evening for what we think is a very timely presentation. For me, this is a very special occasion because it may well be the last time for a while that I'll be hosting these activities. And for those of you who are regulars and have enjoyed these activities, you know that giving that up represents a substantial sacrifice. But uh, my, as many of you know, my nomination to become the 76th Attorney General of the United States is now pending. <laughs> tenure, although all my Democratic friends tell me I'll be back in six months. <laughs> uh, our guests this evening are going to discuss uh, something that is extremely topical, uh, not only by the calendar, but by the uh, character of the presidential campaigns and the issues that have been focused, focused upon. The issue that's going to be discussed, discussed tonight is character. Uh, what is the makeup of uh, those who aspire to the presidency. And we're very fortunate to have as our featured speaker this evening, Gail Sheehan, author of a recent book entitled Character, which examines in detail based upon a series of articles that she wrote in Vanity Fair magazine, uh, the character of many of those who aspire to the presidency this year. Gail uh, has, is no stranger to the Thornburg household. My wife tells me she's been uh, nurtured through several midlife crises uh, by your previous uh, efforts, and we're delighted to have you here this evening. Uh, following uh, Gail Sheehy's uh, observations and presentation, uh, we will have uh, commentary from uh, two outstanding members of the Greater Cambridge, Greater Boston slash community. Uh, Marty Nolan is the editor of the editorial page of the Boston Globe, not unknown in these parts. He is a convicted, uh, practicing, hardcore journalist and will offer the view of the journalistic profession on some of the uh, conclusions reached by Gail Sheehy. In addition to Marty, we have Ron Heifetz, who is a graduate not only of the Harvard Medical School, but holds a master's in public administration from the John F. Kennedy School of Government, where he teaches a very well-attended and highly popular course on the subject of leadership. I think we're in for a first-class evening of discussion on issues that we all, of necessity, are involved with as we work our way toward the November elections. And I thank you all for joining us. I wish you au revoir and hope that uh, in one form or another, I'll be uh, back with you again. But for the moment, let's go to Gail Sheehy, who I'm pleased to introduce. Let's give her a nice welcome to the audience. also one of my favorite towns, being a town whose uh, major crop seems to be Irish politicians. Uh, it puts me in mind of my own family mythology. One of the favorite stories is about my great great aunt Minnie, who uh, came over from Northern Ireland and came through Ellis Island and faced the immigration officers and got to all their tough questions until it came to the last question that's always asked. Do you favor the overthrow of the U.S. government by force or violence? And great great aunt Minnie thought and said, by violence. <laughs> so I always consider myself very lucky to be here at all. Uh, as a journalist, I've been writing about presidential candidates uh, since uh, my political baptism in 1968 when I followed Bobby Kennedy uh, for the last week of his uh, campaign before his tragic assassination. As an author, though, my concentration has been on character and psychological development. Well, in 1984, these two parallel tracks in my work came together very happily when Vanity Fair asked me to write about the character of the candidates for the 88th election. Uh, actually, they just asked me to write about the candidates, and I chose as my focus their character. 
I think the concentration on character in our political history has never before been as intense. Uh, partly it's because we inhabit this hair-trigger global village. Uh, we must be able to see and weigh the innermost nature of our leaders before they come to dominate our lives and control our TV screens. Some people fear that this personal scrutiny is going too far. I don't think it's, going far, it's gone far enough, and here's why. The primary process has killed off political bosses. As you know, there's no more smoke-filled rooms where six guys in bow ties decide who is going to carry their party's flag. The candidates today select themselves, so anybody can run, and, and they do. Astronauts, auto executives, born-again preachers. There's no party discipline to weed them out. The candidates, if they can raise their own money, hire their own media managers, package themselves like perfumed soap, and soon appear on our TV screens asking us to believe some incredible things, that they've performed economic miracles, that they've stopped hurricanes in their tracks, or that they've found some nice, clean freedom fighters in Iran just hiding under their turbans, waiting to spring on the Ayatollah and bring him down with a cake and a Bible. Well, the American public is very savvy. People sense that image and reality have become as blurred in the political world as they ever were in Hollywood. And I think we need the cold slap of insight to wake us up from these smoothly contrived images. So the fascination with character today may be instinctual for Americans who've bought one president after another for neatly packaged virtues they turned out not to have. The new Nixon, Lyndon the peacemaker, the competent Carter, Reagan the great manager. And in fact, research today shows that in presidential elections, most people are not voting on the issues, they're voting on character, or what they perceive as character. So I set out to uncover what makes the, make these men tick. Now, what I'm going to say here tonight will sound like a bunch of flash judgments, because I can only give you tiny snippets from what I have prepared and, and put out in a book, but they're not. Here's how I arrived at them. Instead of spending all my time on the campaign trail following the candidates, I really traveled to the towns of rural America where most of these candidates were nurtured. I don't know, we won't, we won't call Brookline rural, but um, the others really mostly were in rural places. Uh, and I spoke with their mothers and their aunts, their sisters, their rivalrous brothers, the coach that forged the competitive spirit, the significant teacher, and there always is one. And then I compared notes with their wives, and the people who've worked with or for them through all their successes and setbacks up to the present. It's really like working on a psychological thriller because you're looking for the missing person behind the photos and the resumes and the campaign propaganda. Finally, I have at least two long interviews with the candidate and test my insights on him firsthand. And his response is always illuminating and it tells a good deal about how much the man knows or wants to know about himself. Now, Dukakis and Bush will both turn themselves inside and out not to be specific about issues. You've probably gathered that by now yourself. They, they're going to compete characters. Dukakis, I think, has decided long ago to run on competence and character. <clears throat> and by the middle of this summer, his campaign uh, has been able to frame him as steady, clear, confident manager, comfortable with himself, not distracted from his goals by the drumbeat of events or thrown off stride by rumors, and content to run on impenetrable generalities. His campaign, on the other hand, attempts to portray Bush as the opposite, a man, quote, out of control, a man who, quote, has no center. In an increasingly panicky reaction, the Bush campaign has declared itself intent on raising Dukakis's negatives in the polls. Even President Reagan was willing to fan unsubstantiated rumors that the governor had been treated by a psychiatrist for depression, uh, making what appeared to be a joke about him as an invalid. Other Republican right-wingers have assiduously contacted major media outlets to whisper that Dukakis has, was the one responsible for his mentally unstable brother's death and that his wife has had multiple abortions and affairs. These are the kinds of rumors that are being put around. and the. The tagline is always, look into it. So it can get really ugly, this character battle. <clears throat> what is character? Well, I think of it as the enduring marks left by life that set one apart as an individual. Inborn temperament certainly plays a part, 
but also the people and events that have left a lasting impact, the inner engravings. And we all make judgments about people every day. When we come to voting, to doing something as important as voting for president, what do we judge? Well, we judge from a life history and from a pattern of behavior. It's the same kind of judgment that we make every day about our neighbors or about the candidate our daughter might bring home uh, for husband. Candidates, as we know, change on issues according to polls and according to events. If you remember, Gephardt was tossed out for being a flip-flopper. So I think a more reliable index is character, those inner engravings that experience has left on someone. Issues are today, but character is what was yesterday and will be tomorrow. Now, Americans, I think, are more sophisticated and interested in character uh, of their political leaders than they were 20 or 30 years ago um, because uh, once a candidate becomes a candidate, especially for president, with all the mass marketing at his disposal, with the highest talent and media advisors and so on, he goes on autopilot. You get the same answers by rote. There's almost nothing you can ask that he hasn't answered a hundred times. So you don't learn very much about what's behind the facade or the prepared presentation. Uh, I think a better measure is to go back and consult his life history. The first character study I did was on Gary Hart. It makes me hot to think about it. By August 87, when I came out with an article in Vanity Fair uh, saying uh, a pathological deficit in Gary Hart's character ruled the public man as thoroughly as it ruled the private one, it stirred tremendous controversy. But let's review the, the bidding. I had first written about Hart in 84, but it was during the primary season when Hart had burst upon the scene like the gentleman caller of American politics young, smart, philosopher of new ideas. He seemed ready to deliver us from the bad old days. And I was in, as impressed as anyone. But it was the hardest time to get an accurate fix on him. Friends, neighbors, even casual acquaintances all of a sudden became instant experts on Gary Hart. And all the stories out of his hometown, naturally, were good. It wasn't until he dropped out in the spring of 87 that good research could really be done. I went back immediately to Ottawa, straight to the barber shop. And of course, the guys were all sitting around, the ones who'd grown up with Hart, and they were shaking their heads and confused as they could be. And talking with them and talking with his relatives, it turned out that Gary Hart had two people inside that had been fighting to get out. He was a very repressed little boy. He'd grown up in an extremely restricted religious sect. His friends, the guys at the barber shop, had assumed that his life and the restrictions were pretty much like it was for them in a conservative Midwest town. Most people were Baptists or Methodists, but Gary belonged to a sect of which there were only 50 members and four teenagers, and those four were he, two of those four were himself and his sister. He wasn't allowed to do lots of things, go to the movies, for instance. So his friends would go to the movies, and he'd take them aside and ask them the plot so he could fib about it and save himself the humiliation of being different. Well, that established a pattern of fibbing that went on into greater lies. But he went on like this, being perfect, and with a very, very punishing, punitive mother who was compulsively clean. She moved the uh, family from house to house uh, a dozen times while he was in school. As a result, even at the age of 10, he, w he was afraid to take more than one toy out of the box at a time for fear he couldn't keep it clean. So it wasn't until he was 24 and he broke out. It was like jumping over the, the wall. He did it by changing his name, going to the courthouse. His mother did not approve and she did not turn up. And from that time on, he went completely in the other direction, seeking all the kinds of little testing experiences and sowing wild oats that he'd missed in his teenage years. And finally, it led him to such a conflict between being perfect, adhering to that childhood inner demon, and experiencing the libertine side that he'd been denied. And it seems the only way that he could compose the doubleness was to be endorsed by the American people as being so worthy so much better than all the rest that he alone could break all the rules of personal and political conduct and still be president. 
Now, here's the object lesson. Gary Hart was the titular head of the Democratic Party on and off for almost four years. It took that long for the American public to finally put together his own public behavior with reporting on patterns of behavior throughout his lifetime to say, wait a minute, this could be a dangerous man to have the reins of the free world in his hands because he seems to have to self-destruct just as he's about to get what he appears to want. So, yes, character matters. And yes, it takes a long time to figure it out. Now, Jesse Jackson uh, is one of the most complex characters on the American political scene. Uh, to my mind, he seems to be in the middle of at least three passages at once, personal, political, and historical. The main passage being from outsider to insider, a passage he cannot complete. Uh, he cannot depart from his outsider status or he loses touch with his base, his inner base as well as his electoral base. Uh, and yet he can't uh, do too much to uh, impede his progress as an insider because he will lose this place at the banquet table that he has earned and, uh, and enjoys. Jesse, of course, was born out of wedlock, as he says very often in his own inspirational message. But it was more than that. It was also a cause of immense jealousy on his part. Certainly to be the out child in a black family in the Deep South was nothing unusual. And the other children didn't start taunting him until Jesse was five. But by then, he lived with his mother and stepfather in an intact two-income family and a neat wood frame house. But when I went to Greenville, South Carolina, to do research, I found there was another house in a neighborhood where the more favored black residents lived, a fieldstone suburban home with pillars that was so grand it brought people to stop and stare from across the street. This was the palace of Jesse's blood father, Noah Robinson. Well, one day, Jesse had stood at the edge of his school playground, which was diagonally across from this house, and peered into the yard at another little boy, just about his age, playing in the yard, Noah Robinson, Jr., who told me about the scene. When Noah looked up and waved, suddenly they both knew. They looked too much alike. They had to be brothers. Well, after that, nothing was ever the same for Jesse. Once he'd seen how his own other half lived, his was not a fine childhood at all. His nose pressed to the glass, he watched Noah Jr.'s privileged existence. The sting was in the difference between the status of his half-brother, a prince who could move back and forth between black and white worlds at a time when the color barrier was monolithic, and the stepson of a postal worker. Well, Jesse's blood father would sneak around to the schoolyard and give him handouts, little nickels, he called them. At Thanksgiving and Easter, ba a basket would arrive with no card. You sense these distinctions, Jackson acknowledged to me. You long for the privileges other people have. And so young Jesse began to boast. And many times, defiantly, he would tell his blood father, from as early as the age of six or seven, just you watch. I'm going to be more than you think I can be. Well, he hasn't stopped trying or boasting since. And one anecdote I can tell you that I witnessed in Davenport, Iowa, brings it home. Davenport is the kind of town where adults at the dinner table will say with a straight face, I never saw one until I was eight or nine, speaking of black people. Well, one day in the fall of 87, the Reverend Jesse Jackson was coming to visit the elementary school in Davenport. And the kids were all lined up on both sides of the halls, and the teachers had them very well disciplined. They, every single one of them had a sign saying, Welcome, Jesse Jackson. I'm proud of you, Jesse Jackson. You're nice, Jesse Jackson. And their faces were a mural of smiles. But when you talked to them individually, you soon found that while some kids saw Jackson as a hero, others didn't want to discuss him. So I sat in the auditorium next to a little freckle-faced, red-headed boy, just a squirt, eight years old. And uh, to the group around me, which was black and white students, I asked, do you think the Reverend Jesse Jackson could be president? He said, yeah, yeah, why not? That'd be cool. All of a sudden, this little boy said, no way. I looked down at this little eight-year-old, and I said, what makes you so sure? And he said, if a black man gets to be president, white folks would be slaves. Well, I said, where did you hear that, sweetheart, at home? He said, that's right. And he sat back with his little chin tucked in his neck. Well, down front, Jesse Jackson connected immediately with the kids, and he gave the kind of psychodrama he's been performing in schools for the last 15 years. 
and he got them up on their feet and they were chanting and having a wonderful time. I am. And he says, oh, you're just a little too quiet for me. Say, I am. And the kid said, I am somebody, somebody. My mind is a pearl. I can learn anything in the world. Well, by this time, the kids are screaming. They are beside themselves. And over the din of the applause, I tapped the little freckle-faced boy and I said, do you like him a little better than you thought you would? And he said, he's okay. And I said, would you like to meet him in person? He said, yeah. <laughs> so as Jackson was coming up the aisle, I signaled to him. I said, Reverend, would you say hello to this young man? He's heard that if a black person becomes president, white people become slaves. Instantly, Jackson bends over and clasps the boy's arm and croons to him. That's not true. I love you very much, buddy. Okay? All right? Well, tears gushed out, and the boy buried his face. His whole world of thought stall dividing pre prejudice was suddenly in collapse. And Jackson kept going, feel better. God bless you, brother. I love you, buddy. Okay? Well, there wasn't a dry eye all around me. Now, Jesse Jackson has always had a feel for the hurting ones. And he also has an eye out at all times for the limelight. And within an hour of this moving encounter, Jesse Jackson, who was then the Democratic front runner in the presidential race, was bragging to reporters about how beautifully he'd handled it. <laughs> so that personal message when he was a very little boy, I think, marked his character with a lust for legitimacy as well as a gift for empathy. And we've all heard it and felt it in his moving refrain at the convention, I understand. <clears throat> uh, he had a um, an impasse with Michael Dukakis, as you all know. And we followed it day by day, all worried that this was going to come to no uh, good end. Well, it it was almost it was very interesting to watch these two men who are, have two different sports in their head, two different games in their head. Dukakis, the marathoner, a solo runner, Manos Mu, as he learned, as his first words, by myself. When he wins a race, there's only one winner. And for weeks after the, uh, after the primaries were over, Jackson refused to concede that there was a winner. He was still playing the game. And he was playing like a superstar forward, like Michael Jordan, like the Chicago Bulls stu superstar. He was going to control the ball. And he kept dribbling and dribbling. He'd draw a few fouls along the way, but kept things bouncing back and forth as long as he could until he was ready to slam dunk it. Well, uh, the problem was that Jackson, that Dukakis finally controlled the timing. Uh, and Jackson got a little worried, and by Sunday night, before the convention opened, when I crossed paths with him, he said, uh, I'm trying to reach Dukakis. I've got to sit down with him. I can't get him to talk to me. And I said, what's the relationship? He said, there's no relationship. No commitment, no relationship. Well, when they finally sat down, uh, they had to discuss what Jackson meant by respect, what he meant by partnership, and, uh, and what he meant by respect really was uh, pushing for every special consideration he can get. It's not an accident that his first organization was named PUSH. Uh, and it isn't good enough to be treated, in his view, as Dukakis aides praised it, like any other runner-up. It all translated into a showcase for him and jobs for his people in the campaign, and he hoped in the transition and in the administration, although there was no deal made on those points. Um, so, but I think Jackson gave something to Dukakis that was very necessary. I think he gave Dukakis just a touch of soul. He l let him know how important it was to make a connection on a personal level, to give personal respect. And Dukakis did the one thing he could do, confirm the respect that Jesse earned at the convention because of his performance. And he did that in his speech on the last night, and he sealed the bond with the personal reference to Jackson's daughter. Now, I, I think that these are all driven people. I don't think there's any other kind who runs for president. That's the first thing. Then the question becomes, what are they driven by? Is it a pathological need or something that's going to come a cropper if they get into the Oval Office? Or is it a healthy need for recognition and success in public service? I think in the case of both the nominees, they really are motivated by public service, but they also need to win. Uh, Bush loves to win, whether it's tiddlywinks or paddle tennis or uh, anything. He always had that prescription from his family, especially from his mother. Dukakis can't stand to lose. 
and he disregards limitations, like his height, for instance. In 16 of the last 20 elections, the tallest man has won. Well, that might discourage some people, right? But let me tell you two things that are interesting. One, when Dukakis was in seventh grade and the gym teacher said, all the tall kids line up on the other side of the gym for basketball, Dukakis went right over and joined them. <laughs> he had himself, he told me, he had himself programmed to grow three inches a year until he reached 5'11". Well, he stopped at five, seven and a half or so, and that was it. But he didn't let that stop him. He just ignored his limitations. Uh, as you all know, Dukakis lost once, the first time, at anything he really cared about. And he was in his early 40s, and it was humiliating. It was devastating. Uh, and I think he can't stand ever to lose again and to revisit that pain. So we will see a fight, chariot wheel to chariot wheel, right down to the finish line with these two candidates. Now let me just say a few other words about Michael Dukakis. Um, does he have an Achilles heel? Sure. I mean, the Greeks invented it, right? Uh, manos mu, that's a clue. Manos mu, all by myself. First words he learned. Um, a technocrat, um, moved by his own instincts, as he's told me repeatedly, there's very little I don't feel strongly about. Uh, and in fact, he said that uh, one of the uh, biggest mistakes he made in his first term was to allow himself to be moved by his instincts, to think that once he saw the solution uh, or somebody else gave him a solution and it was a fix, he would just move with it and say, let's go, bang, and expect everybody else to recognize the purity of his motives and the rightness of the solution and move along with him. Well, they didn't. And uh, they rewarded him with a, uh, a very painful rejection. And so he has now imposed a, a discipline on himself to sit back when he has an idea or it's presented to him and, and operate with restraint and control and consensus. Now, um, friends say it took him several years to get through the tremendous pain and humiliation and guilt of that uh, repudiation for re-election as governor. But he did pick himself up and begin to take himself apart piece by piece pretty soon afterwards and to say, I blew it, I blew it. This too, manos mu, by myself, he took the responsibility. Uh, but he did make a real effort to be more of a consensus builder and has continually made, attempted to modify that aspect of his character. He'll always be stubborn, uh, but he is, is aware of it. Now there's also a private side to Mike Dukakis that the, the public rarely sees on TV. Perhaps some of you have gotten to know it because you live here, but He's very playful, um, particularly with his wife. They tease unmercifully. It's almost become a, a burlesque. Uh, there's a great deal of romance and even erotic energy between the two of them that's beginning to come across uh, in their appearances. And interestingly, they've made the decision to campaign together for the rest of the uh, three months because, as Dugaka said to me, we're better together politically. It's very interesting. Uh, He's a doer, but he also has an interesting affinity for dreamers and passionate idealists, his opposites. He married one of them. And he likes to have such people around him to challenge him and prod him to take risks. Now, I'll just finish with George Bush. The oper operative thing, I think, about George Bush and his character is that he's the son of an authoritarian father, Senator Prescott Bush, uh, a very imposing, rather towering man with a very deep voice. Uh, his brothers and sisters all made different adaptations to this authoritarian father, but George's adaptation, they told me, was to defer, to please, to learn always how to avoid confrontation with the authority figure. Uh, he learned how to put the joke or the punchline in the other person's mouth. Uh, his younger brother calls him a real, real teacher's pet. His sister, who is a common cause liberal, so they don't see eye to eye politically, constantly says to him, damn it, George, tell us what you think. Uh, he used to make his mother laugh in church so hard that the whole family would have to leave the church. Well, that's one of the reasons that he's almost impossible not to like as a person, in person. He really has 2,000 closest friends. Where the problem comes is in projecting a strong persona publicly or a center. He's gone out of his way all of his life to avoid confrontation. Uh, and now having had seven years as vice president to an authority figure much like his father, uh, the case could be made that it's the worst training for a leader. 
In recent months, of course, everyone has been telling him, you must distinguish yourself from Reagan. You must separate yourself. Reagan being an, almost a stand-in for his father, very difficult for Bush. Uh, and we, we hear him struggling with it publicly. It's, it's, it's quite painful. He'll say, uh, Oh, just days after promising on June 6th that he would make, quote, a shift soon to move out from under Reagan's shadow, Bush was publicly complaining in California that he didn't want to be inching away from President Reagan at all. It's sort of like watching somebody writhe through an identity confusion that most late adolescents would recognize. I must stand up to my father. I must define my political identity, as Bush told uh, the, uh, the public in mid-June. Um, the other thing that's very interesting about Bush, I think, is uh, how he works with his operatives. Um, because I think you can make a case that the campaign is the candidate and tells you a great deal about how he would operate in the White House. Of the 25 Republican operatives I interviewed for a story that's coming out this week in Vanity Fair called Beating Around Bush, <laughs> um, all of them acknowledge the lack of a driving Bush ideology or theme. His uh, pollster and chief strategist, Bob Teeter, says, I've spent a lot of time in the last year or two saying, what do you want to run on? One of the few issues that really excited the Veep, he's fired off many new notes to Teeter about it, is nuclear prolifer proliferation on the Indian subcontinent. Well, it's not exactly an issue to pass the shot and beer test. You know, when two strangers knock elbows at the bar, do they say, so what do you think about this nuclear proliferation on the Indian subcontinent? Um, the one clear message Bush has been taking around the country is, I want to be the education president. And then he often tortures his grammar and snarls his syntax until people wonder if he's doing a stand-up on Saturday Night Live. <clears throat> well, when that message fell flat, Teeter sent Bush out to fight for the ethnic blue-collar voters who were pivotal to Reagan's winning coalition. He said, you get them the same way we got them last time, on patriotic and national security issues. And so Bush went after Dukakis on the Pledge of Allegiance in schools, and later he tapped a deep anti-Iranian sentiment when he championed the, the captain of the USS Vincennes action in shooting down an Iranian passenger jet. Well, <clears throat> if you put together his circle, that they call it G6, um, uh, typically modest, they're uh, making an allusion to G7 uh, group of industrial nations, um, and they are, half of them are super cautious moderators, Bob Teeter, uh, Craig Fuller, uh, Nicholas Brady, who's now going to be Treasury Secretary, and um, Buzz Mossbacker. And then there are two aggressors, uh, Lee Atwater, who the others say needs adult supervision, <laughs> and Roger Ailes, the um, hired gun who gave um, uh, Reagan his, his anti-age um, line in, in the second debate against Mondale and uh, who, who, uh, who created the new Nixon. Now, <clears throat> the chemistry of the original team that this G6 produced a high voltage field around the candidate, um, but no one of its members dominated. And so long as events didn't require active leadership, Bush made this clubby circle work very well for him. Indeed, its fragmented collegiality mirrored Bush's own character. And this way, uh, he has always shielded himself from confrontation and avoided blame when things go wrong. But when, as the campaign is heated up, um, he, there has to be more direction. There has to be a center. There has to be a leader. Um, Nick Brady told me there is nobody in camp command of G6, not before and not now. And he was saying it as a positive. He said, in G6, everybody is on every side of every argument. So you talk to four different people, and you get four different answers. Well, that's exactly what Republican insiders diagnosed as the chronic ailment within the Bush team, no center. The group had two ways of reaching a decision. Either everyone was gotten together in a room to reach a consensus on whether to do A and B, and then try to sell their decision to Bush, which was often too late to matter, or failing unanimity, they felt back to log rolling, agreeing to do A and B, or to do nothing. Um, this is the formula that resulted in Bush's mixed message. And the Bush organization is essentially the same team that was a marvel of discipline during Reagan's re-election campaign. Yet, gathered around Bush, these advisors fall into a different pattern, uh, flailing about between thrust and drift, alternating between smugness and panic, and negative uh, campaigning. What was the problem? Well, observers say it's simple. In Reagan, they had a man who had done nothing but take direction all his life. 
If we told Reagan to walk outside, this comes from one of his inside political operatives. If we told Reagan to walk outside, turn around three times, pick up an acorn, throw it out to the crowd, we'd be lucky to get a question from him asking why. <clears throat> Bush is different, says this source, although very different. Bush doesn't take direction. And not a few times, admits Roger Ailes, he's told him, Bush has told him, go to hell, I'm 64 years old and I'll do what I want. Now, Nick Brady points out that for three years, he resisted everybody that said, now you've got to change. It might seem contradictory at first in light of Bush's deferential, often passive appearance, but his resistance to taking direction is an additional dimension to his pattern. He doesn't try to dominate others, but he also refuses to be dominated by others, except by the authority figure in his life, such as his father or more recently Reagan. And this is an, the unspoken bond between Bush and his inner circle. It's as if he told them, I'm a decent guy, and I don't want to be pushed around. If you push me around, then you force me to exercise my leadership and speak up against you. So what would they be like as president, based on what we know so far about the uh, characters? Well, Bush, I'd predict, would try to be everyone's best friend. Uh, and he that would, he would uh, be very comforting, um, but he won't be able to take the heat. Uh, if you have to sell some bitter medicine and sell something that people have to stick with, uh, you have to be prepared to take some criticism and nasty uh, backlash. You can't be a leader and make everybody like you all the time. Dukakis, I imagine, would be more like a teacher. He feels comfortable in the role of teacher. Why not? He learned it right here, and he really enjoyed it. Uh, and his kids tell me that what they liked best about being with their dad were the long Socratic dialogues. He had incredible, and still has incredible patience with his kids. And even his daughters, his son said, he even listened to them. Uh, so uh, he challenged them to think about the world, uh, asked them uh, the tough questions. And uh, I think he enjoys doing that. And I think if he did that as president, uh, that would be a, a very effective way to bring us through a period that's going to be extremely painful. Uh, examining how characters formed in our national readers, leaders is also an effective way to learn about ourselves. Because I think as we peer into the mirror provided by these larger than life personalities, we learn what's demanded and what works, and what is the price for avoiding or denying confrontation with reality and with life's major passages. So it's more than just a factor in our evaluation of how we're going to vote for our leaders. Character affects us all as an essential ingredient in how we work and play and deal with other people. None of us certainly goes out of our way to change unless we're pressed to do so. So I look for the willingness to change and grow as the guide to a successful character. And I'd like to uh, send you off with my favorite quotation from Goethe. Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Thank you. It would be hard to think of a, a more negative campaign. Uh, one side called the presidential candidate of the other a popinjay, a symbol of vainglory, a supreme egotist, and the other side called the other party's candidate a baboon, a gorilla, etc. Uh, in this campaign, there was some talk of uh, psychotherapy because one of the candidates, Abraham Lincoln, was known for his fits of depression and surely uh, could have used some help. The other candidate was George Brinton McClellan, the Democratic choice for president in 1864. He was a manic depressive. His military career showed it. He was later diagnosed. He uh, was one given for great parades of the Army of the Potomac back and forth, up and down the streets of Washington. Meanwhile, Lincoln said to him, you know, General, if you're not using the Army, could we borrow it a while? <laughs> and um, Lincoln, deciding that McClellan had a case of the slows, uh, decided to get another 
general to command the Army of the Potomac, and in revenge, the Democrats nominated McClellan to run in 1864. With McClellan, every setback was an identity crisis, uh, which perhaps explains why he carried New Jersey in the uh, contest. Uh, I know there's always New Jersey is all around you. Um, at any rate, he only carried uh, Kentucky, New Jersey, and that was about it. And Lincoln was elected, and the Union was saved, and uh, politics went on as usual. I bring this out to show that we've survived worse. Uh, and I bring this out to, to salute Gail Sheehy, because what Gail Sheehy's book has done, and her writings in Vanity Fair have done for me, as a, an ink-stained wretch, as Governor Thornburg mentioned, is to uh, provide a shortcut for those of you in the business of uh, reporting uh, because she defines the most important aspect of politics and that indeed is character. Now when I was a young reporter full of beans, and this is some years ago, I always thought, ah, the best question to ask a candidate is, how you doing on that steelworkers endorsement? Or how's your fundraising? And how you doing in Waxahachie County? Candidates love those questions. Oh, but it gives every reporter a sense of being sophisticated and one of the cognoscenti, and I'm a smart guy, aren't I, governor, or senator, or congressman, whoever it is. The question that the uh, candidates do not like to hear is, why are you running? You know, what difference will it make if you're elected? What are the first one, two, three things you'll do if you're elected? They don't like those questions. Well, on the premise that um, those of us engaged in covering politics are almost as crazy as those involved in politics itself, I look forward to the day when a routine question from reporters to candidates will be, have you ever been treated for any ailment that required psychotherapy? And if not, why not? <laughs> I covered, as Gail said, I covered the new Nixon. Oh, ho, uh, I covered the new Nixon. I covered, I don't know how many new Nixons there were. Uh, uh, I covered the competent Carter and um, Ford and Reagan and all these guys. And the truth is that it does come down to character. The American people are very sensible. The vast majority of them are going to wait until after the World Series to give any serious thought to this thing. We, the, that's why the polls fluctuate. It really is true. Character will be the determining factor. Now, in my job, it's a wonderful job now that I, I have. I don't have to go out and, and uh, do as much shoe leather work. I get invited. I was up in Kennebunkport a few weeks ago. The people at the Boston Globe were invited to go talk to Vice President Bush and I thought back to how I've known some of these characters over the years. Now, I remember when George Bush was elected in 66 uh, from a Houston district, and I covered the House of Representatives, and he used to hang out with the Massachusetts crowd, mainly because in those days, to hang out with Republican Southern congressmen, I mean, they were pretty uh, gamey characters in those <laughs> days. You wouldn't want to be seen with some of them. They were, uh, they were really too far rabidly racist for... George Bush. So he used to hang out with Tip O'Neill and Daddy Boland and Torby McDonald. Jimmy Burke uh, represented the town that uh, Bush was born in, Milton. And uh, Bush was very fond of Burke and would listen to him. Jimmy had a sort of W.C. Fields kind of aspect to him. He'd roll a cigar and he'd say, that young uh, Bush fellow is nice fellow, nice fellow from Texas, you know. You know, his father was Senator Bush. I said, yeah, I know. And he said, nice fellow, really thinks that everything's on the level. <laughs> Which, in a way, from uh, Jimmy Burke's contest, uh, context here was actually a, a sort of a tribute. And uh, because it meant that he was in the tradition of Leverett Saltonstall, Elliot Richardson, Frank Sargent, all of whom were very amiable people. And, uh, and public service was in the blood and so forth. So when I was walking a few weeks ago through the Walker's Point up in Kennebunkport, I said, uh, nice place, Mr. Vice President. And he said, yeah. And he said, you know, 
They tell me that I get in trouble up here. You know, Dukakis goes to Nantucket for three days, and he's a smart, competent manager. I go up here for three days, and I'm wallowing in elitism, you know? He said, well, let me tell you, we've lived in a lot of places, Barbara and I, over the last years. We've lived in China and New York and so forth. Well, damn it, this is my house, and if this is going to get me in trouble, I don't care. This is my place, and politics be damned. And I thought, hey, that's pretty good. It struck me that sometime after the World Series, people will discover that George Bush is a pretty nice guy. He really is. And I've seen some rats. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I've covered the Boston City Council. I've covered, you know, so I've covered the Senate, the House, and he really is a nice guy. Then the st thought struck me on Monday afternoon, once again, not because I'm a nice fella, but because people read the Boston Globe, we were invited up to the State House to Governor Dukakis' office. And I'm sitting next to him, and he's talking on and on about anything you want, you know, any the cherry sheets that tell you how much local aid there is and how he's going to make, you know, some station in Weymouth make it into a, a coal-powered nuclear plant that's going to be XX cheaper, you know, the usual Dukakis uh, small talk. And, uh, and I'm sitting next to him, thinking, you know, except for the flecks of gray in his hair, we are back 26 years ago when I covered the legislature, and we could be sitting in the back of the House chamber talking about the crucial need to reform automobile insurance, you know, a need that continues, as we know. And, uh, and I said, this guy doesn't change. Uh, I admire Gail Sheehy for doing all of the work that it takes to to find out, as they say in Hollywood, that there's no side. In Hollywood, that means that an actor doesn't really care about the camera angle as much. And that's what Duke, his favorite phrase is, what you see is what you get. I wrote that once about him, and he said, you know, I like that phrase. <laughs> and I said, yeah, it's a good phrase. I said, well, Governor, actually, it's, it's very familiar on Bourbon Street in... Um, in New Orleans because there are a lot of places with female impersonators, so they want to differentiate, which is, the, which is a true story. And he said, well, he said, I think it has other uses. He said, I think it's a good, fr I like that, I like that slogan. Well, I think he was talked out of the slogan, but it is true. So I'm telling you that from my experience, and having read Gail Shee, there are no easy answers. The vice presidency is, alas, a comic office. I mean, it was, you know, it was designed by the founding fathers in a very hot day in Philadelphia. They didn't know what they were doing. Uh, you know, and the uh, George S. Kaufman and Mari Riskin and the Gershwin brothers uh, created Alexander P. Throttlebottom, and it is. Uh, I mean, there's no such thing as a serious vice president. And so that's Bush's burden to overcome. Dukakis has other burdens. Electoral College lock is, is still uh, against Dukakis. I can only urge you to, uh, to, to read the paper. We try to cover these things, uh, to pay attention, but to remember what, uh, what Gail Sheehy said, which is, issues are today, and character is what was yesterday and what will be tomorrow. Gail Sheehy's on the right track. I commend her works to you. Thank you. Well, it would be fun to talk about the uh, candidates themselves and try to psychoanalyze them further than they've already been psychoanalyzed. But I haven't gotten to know the candidates personally myself, nor have I had the opportunity to collect the kind of evidence that Gail Sheehy's worked on collecting for years, nor Marty Nolan. So I think what I could best do tonight is talk about Gail Sheehy's whole approach. And is it a good approach or is it misguided? First, let me suggest that there is a basic bias in this whole psychological approach to character. Now, I would imagine that all of you would share this bias. 
but it is worth remembering at least that it is a bias. And the bias is that people are healthier when they can face reality. <laughs> That's not a trivial statement. Indeed, uh, Sigmund Freud turned his whole theory around on the question, are people oriented in their lives to uh, pleasure or to the reality that they have to face? Now, we've seen, I think, and Gail described it pretty eloquently uh, in her book, the extent to which people will prefer illusion to reality. We've seen that a lot in the last eight years. <laughs> Let me give you an example so that it's, this, isn't, this isn't just flip. The American people have been sold on the idea, or nearly sold on the idea, that it's possible for us to become invulnerable to all nuclear weapons, a shield of defense. Now, most experts know that even if you were able to technologically create such a shield, it still wouldn't be invulnerable to biological or chemical weapons. They can still get you if they want to. But the illusion of being invulnerable is so delicious that people prefer it rather than staring at the much more frustrating reality of how do you make a more uh, secure relationship with a party that you will always be mutually vulnerable to. Well, that's tough. So, it's important to note that there are some people who don't operate along this reality principle. Indeed, every uh, person running for office hires a pollster to determine which current problem uh, does the society most want to flee from and how to package the direction of the flight. <laughs> it may be, indeed, that the process of getting elected is a process that weeds out the opportunity for leadership because you don't get elected if you challenge people to face issues they'd rather not face. We have to ask, if we're going to be studying character, is it pop psychology or is it good analysis? Uh, Gail Sheehy's been criticized for uh, offering pop psychology. It seems to me, as best as I can judge from the reading that I've done, that uh, she's providing pioneering and damn good journalism that happens to be rooted in psychological analysis, which doesn't happen to be particularly unusual. It just happens to be deeper and a bit more thorough than the psychological analysis you get and generally are so used to that you're not even aware that you're getting when you read the paper. For example, today I was reading the paper, Marty's page. <laughs> so here's an article about Bush. In Bush's darkest hour, when he looked as though he might lose it all in the New Hampshire primary, Bush stuck with the belief that the best thing he had going for him was Reagan. Well, that's a psychological interpretation that Bush stuck with a belief. Now, that sounds trivial, but one could easily, indeed, I think, uh, looking at Gale's analysis, you could suggest that Bush had no choice but to stick with that belief because he didn't have it in him to go against the grain of this powerful and dominant authority figure in his life, Ronald Reagan. So it's not as if he made a strategic choice to stick with uh, Ronald Reagan. It's as if he had no choice at all. So wouldn't it be interesting and wouldn't it be useful if in our journalism, as standard practice, 
we had the kind of analysis that went a little deeper than uh, these kinds of interpretations, which I would call pop psychology. Indeed, quite uh, probably inaccurate. At least it doesn't provide any alternative ways of interpreting what Bush was about when he made that, when he was at that moment. Or take this one. Same page. Jesse Jackson, who put many conditions on his full participation, seems to be bored and is dabbling in detente with New York Mayor Ed Koch and some mysterious negotiations with the Israeli ambassador. He is also at some pains to establish a separate identity and ambition the Dukakis campaign endorses. Well, there's a lot of pop psychology in that statement, a great deal. But we as readers don't really have a sense, we're not given a sense, where this psychologizing comes from, what uh, the writers, the journalists' uh, frame of reference is. We certainly don't know what our evidence is to say that he seems to be bored or that he's at pains. He could be a lot of other things. He could be on automatic pilot, just living out, repeating patterns that have uh, been generated over the years. And we ought to know, and we ought to be thinking about it. And so it would seem to me that the criticism that this is pop psychology is indeed a way of journalists avoiding the extent to which they're engaging in pop psychology every day and denying it which is a psychological problem. <laughs> now, it's also been uh, posited that Gail Sheehy is a plagiarist. Indeed, there was a scathing article a few days ago, in the last few days, that she's a plagiarist and how can you possibly trust her analysis of other people? Well, I don't really know Gail Sheehy's story, and I can't psychologize about her. She seems like a nice person, but people fool me all the time. <laughs> but this leads to a quite an important point, I think, which is that I think it's irrelevant, which was Gary Hart's point, except it's a little different in this case. <laughs> it's irrelevant because what matters is taking to heart, so to speak, seriously analyzing, scrutinizing, being critical with our own capacities, what she's got to say. And that's what matters. Is what she got to say worth listening to and is what she got to say not worth listening to? Now where was she to be up for office? Where we would be conferring authority on her? Where we would be to some extent winding her up and letting her go in on a trajectory that we wouldn't necessarily be able to follow because we don't have access to the Oval Office every day to make mid-course correction on our presidents. Then perhaps it would be quite relevant to know is she a plagiarist. Which gets to this next question, why is it relevant at all for us to study character? Well, it seems pretty evident and I think both people here have made a pretty good argument why it's relevant, but I think it's also important to note why it's not relevant or why it's misleading. Why it's misleading has to do with the ex extent to which what matters isn't simply why the performer sings the kind of song they sing. What matters is why we listen. It seems to me that it's too easy for journalists to let the American people or let the local community off the hook by focusing all the attention on those attempting to achieve positions of authority. That focusing on character has its useful sides, but it's also distracting. It's also too entertaining compared to the much harder work of examining and analyzing why we listen why we prefer illusions at times. Why would we go for somebody who preaches competence 
as if the problems of the country were akin to the problems to be fixed by a car mechanic. Or why we would want to listen to somebody who uh, presents uh, fantasies and fake remedies. Comforting, but not particularly nurturing. That needs to be analyzed. And it would seem to me then that journalists, including Gail Sheehy, have fallen into the trap of feeding the American public's current mechanism of avoiding taking responsibility, which is to focus all their attention on the vote, as if the decision for the man or the woman is the key decision. Thereafter, they can go back to sleep for another four years. Well, the key decision isn't to vote. The key decision is to what extent, to what extent, can journalists help the American people, help the community, face what the American community needs to face up to on various fronts? To ask the candidates to do that job is really quite unfair because the candidates can't possibly do that work for us all by themselves. So the focus on character is quite useful because it's important to know uh, what kinds of vulnerabilities, what kinds of predilections do these people have that might make them prone to avoiding contending with what needs to be contended with. But it's also important for us to get the help from the journalists in analyzing the dynamics in the polity at large in answer to the question why we listen and what are we listening for. Thank you. have a uh, comment from any member of our panel about things said by uh, someone else. Well, I'll, I'll take a, a whack at um, commenting on the, on the challenge that Ron uh, posed at the end, which I think is a very good one, how to, uh, uh, to analyze why we listen and what we're listening for. Um, I think that uh, so much of that is cyclical. Um, we live cyclically. Um, the first wife uh, is a bum, and so the second wife is going to be different. Um, we change according to we have a we we proceed on a course. We live it for, in political terms, usually something like 17 years if you buy the Schlesinger theory, and then we change course. Um, it, with Reagan, Reagan came along at a time when this, this country had lost a, a considerable amount of confidence, really a, a, a very serious faltering in our confidence, for all the reasons that you know. Um, and he was an actor who lived in a world of illusion, who had been a, uh, a dreamer all of his life, um, and who had been paid as a dreamer, uh, first as a, uh, a lifeguard, a sports announcer, then an actor, uh, GE Theater, and so on. Um, he would be able, his um, closest advisors told me, when faced with um, a problem and no really positive solutions, a lot of negative uh, uh, aspects to a problem, he would simply find somebody would provide him with a fantasy or an illusion, or he would come up with one himself. And once he seized on that, it would become for him reality. And because it became for him reality, he could then sell it to the public totally guilelessly over television, and it would be very comforting to the rest of us. Now, depending on, I mean, he sold us on Reaganomics in the first six months of his term. Reaganomics was really a, a 42 page uh, job resume by David Stockman. Uh, and David, David Stockman tried to remove it from Reagan's mind. 
after he went back to his calculator and found out that it wasn't going to work the way he thought it was. But by then it had already become integrated in Reagan's thinking and the uh, fantasy had become reality for him and he proceeded with it. It, it locked in with some of his ideological um, uh, beliefs and he was never dissuaded from it. So, and it was very comforting to us. Somebody has the answer and it's called Reaganomics and, and, and it's going to make everything better. Well, after eight years of, or seven years of Reagan, I think we, many of the American people, we don't know how many, we won't know until the election takes place, um, say they'll always love Reagan for his niceness, for his apparent benevolence, for his uh, inf indefatigable amiability, but he doesn't know how to run anything. People are going to jail, the budget is out of whack, things are not right. So instead of looking this time for another master of illusion and comfort and magic uh, and amiability and a great speech maker, I think many people are looking now for competence, what you see is what you get, um, absolute down to earth, plain, simple, let's, let's get to it and, and, and make things work again. There are still many other people who want to roll over and finish the dream. And many of those people will go for George Bush because he is promising to carry on without any interruption what Reagan started. No adjustments necessary, no pain, uh, no tax raise, no nothing. It's not going to be bad, folks. It's going to be just as good as it was under Reagan. Uh, so we have a real, uh, I, think, I think by doing the character of these candidates uh, and pointing those things out, pointing out the interaction that they have with the, with the public, which is something I try to do parenthetically, um, we begin to understand that the leader is only the projection of the fondest fantasies of the lead at the particular moment in history that he is elected. Thank you. We now have uh, some time left for questions from the audience. We have microphones, two on the first floor and two on the second floor. And uh, people would like to ask a question. Uh, Please, please line up at the microphone. We ask people not to make speeches, but to ask, to ask uh, questions. Uh, if you want to make a speech, see me later, and we'll try to book you in. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Sheehy, uh, I haven't read your series yet, although I subscribe to Vanity Fair. <laughs> I'll read my back copies. But I wonder if you go into the eight-year agony of George Bush and how he suppressed his own self to become a lackey, a, a good kid of uh, Reagan, uh, for instance, when there was deadlock in the Senate on poison gas, they pulled him in to make the vote in favor of, and it hasn't been raised yet in the um, election, but it's a horrendous vote that I'm sure he's not proud of, but that must be only one of the bitter things that he was called upon to do, and I guess it's ammunition for the future, but would you comment in general? Thank you. I commented specifically on that very issue. Um, that was such an agony for George Bush that he asked Ronald Reagan to call his mother and explain why he had had to do it. Um, true story. Um, the other thing is that um, Bush uh, said, said something on television just a couple of days before the 84 election that was very revealing in this regard. He had, in the course of that campaign, been asked by reporters out in the road, well, he was campaigning for Reagan, um, you know, what about raising taxes, what about raising taxes? And finally he said, well, never say never. It would be irresponsible for a leader to say never. Uh, you should keep your options open. And actually a very sane, sensible, honest, nice thing to say. Reagan wasn't having any of it. The next day, Reagan slapped him down. He said, I say never. I don't want to keep my options open. No taxes. Well, Bush brought this up on uh, Face the Nation or Look in the Mirror or one of those. And uh, <laughs> Sam Donaldson got his pants leg in his mouth and he started chewing and he said, now, Mr. Vice President, you said this about taxes and then Reagan said that and so on. And, and, and Bush said, well, oh, wait a minute. I tried, I tried to say my thing once and God, it was terrible. He said, and I don't want to get into anything 48 hours before the election that's going to rob me of my manhood. So, yes, I think that it does it cause considerable conflict and agony uh, in George Bush, and, uh, and it would probably in anybody to be in that position. Dr. Cantrell. 
Thank you. Over the years in government, we've had what I suppose one could call pseudo-rationalities like program planning, budgeting, or in the case of Vietnam, we had the Hamlet evaluation system. To what extent do you think a President Dukakis, given his interest in the rational approach, would succumb to those kinds of, of uh, sort of pseudo cost uh, benefit accounting systems in a complex political world? I guess to our principal speaker, but maybe also to the good doctor if he has a quiet moment on it. Well, can I bow to uh, Ronnie? He's th done a lot of thinking about this, I know. <laughs> I think Marty would know best about this. Uh, I guess the question turns on what did Michael Dukakis actually learn from failing? Did he learn anything or not? We've heard different, two different views. Gail is quite optimistic, thinking that he has. And uh, Marty is quite pessimistic, thinking that he hasn't. Uh, I'd give him about a 30% chance that he has learned something. Which means there's a 70% chance that he would end up behaving, um, continue behaving fundamentally as a technocrat, which means uh, he might bring more people into the decision-making process, but they would essentially be more experts. Uh, not necessarily, he wouldn't necessarily approach it in the educative way uh, that one might hope, at least Gail would hope, I would hope, in which he would, uh, by which he would be uh, orchestrating the conflict, the conflictive interactive process amongst the various factions in the community. That is, making democracy work. Would he be doing that uh, rather than proceeding through expert technocracy? Uh, I would hope so, but I uh, wouldn't give it more than a 30 percent chance. Anybody else choose to comment? Well, if you ask him about Mass Bank, he'll tell you everything's going along fine. This is a program that collapsed of its own weight about three or four years ago, but it tends to forget that. I think he's very slow to admit mistakes, shall we say. I think that's a kindly way of putting it. I, it just is not in him. There's no problem, no problem. Master's miracle, hey, booming along. No problem, no problem. And these aren't vetoes, they're just sort of freezing funds for a while. You know, it, so that's, uh, I don't know if that's, I don't practice without a license, I don't know if that's self-delusion or political patter, but it's uh, certainly a, a firm character trait that's characterized him for many years. All right, I risk revealing the naivete that I show when I talk about politics, which is because when you're outside the process and you try to comment or ask people to comment about the process, you do reveal just how naive you are. But I'd like to return back to the point that Mr. Heifetz was raising, which I thought was really quite an interesting one, although perhaps not the one that's supposed to be the fundamental focus of Ms. Sheehy's talk, but has to do with, well, ultimately, if I could paraphrase, and it's probably wrong, but my own version of it, but it has to do with sort of a whose character is the one to be writing about. I mean, it's one thing to study the character of the leader, but perhaps the more interesting and in some ways the more challenging issue and what I find fascinating about the point you were making and marvelously stimulating is perhaps the correct question is what it says about the character of those who are observing and responding those who are the, are the lead, as it were. And I think it's something that's fascinating, and I guess I make the comment about my naivete, because I'm not a political journalist or a politician, so I'm not a practitioner. One of the things I've learned watching it is what all of us outside of it think people should think about isn't what people can, in fact, practically think about. But could you share some of your thoughts? I think it's a fascinating topic, and I'd like everybody to, to pursue it further for at least a little while. Well, I'll start with by confessing the poverty of the metaphor in my business. Um, we all, the newspapers say, oh, it's a fight or it's a race. Well, it's not a fight. It's not a race. Uh, it's more like, and I credit this to Alan Barron, who is a uh, Democratic activist from Iowa who studied politics a long time. And he said, reporters are wrong when they call it a prize fight or a horse race. It's more like a visit to an art gallery. Well, that's about as different as you can get. So you look at the person going to buy 
the painting. Now, there's one painting on the wall that resembles a Mondrian, and the other one resembles a Rembrandt. Now, what you want to know is, what has that person got hanging on his wall at home? You know, if it's a piece of modern art, you know, the Mondrian's got a better shot at it, you know. And that, I think, the portrait of America is something that we don't do well because of my business's accursed addiction to those silly goddamn poles, which mean nothing, are written in the wind, uh, are an attempt to quantify what cannot and should not be quantified, and our addiction to them obscures what we should be doing, which is to find out what people really want in their next president. And if we, if we, if we gave a better idea of, uh, of what's that all about, it's more important than the latest who struck John of, among the candidates. I'd, uh, I'd add one thing uh, to what Marty's saying, and perhaps it's uh, uh, another angle on it, which is I'm not sure that the uh, problem with the media is that they're addicted to the polls. I think that the problem is that as a society, even though we call ourselves a democracy, we are swept up into trends. Uh, by which we focus our attention on authority figures, thinking that if only we pick the right one, our problems will be solved. And the media, being responsive to its market, indeed uh, very much in, its cult in the current culture, is swept up in the same trend of focusing attention on the authority figures, thinking that that's where the news is. Well, I don't think that's really where the news is. I think that that's a mechanism by which we entertain ourselves and avoid uh, taking responsibility as a community. And I think that uh, Gail's response earlier that this is a cyclical thing and now we're ready to take responsibility is uh, hopeful. I hope she's right, but I think it's really quite naive. I think what we'll buy is another set of avoidance mechanisms by uh, another candidate who will now, through competent management, uh, take the, still pretend to take the problems off our shoulders when to really make progress on these problems we're going to have to do that work. Uh, I just, is this working? Um, remind you that when Jimmy Carter tried to tell us what the real problems were and that some of them were intractable and that we had a national malaise which we did um, we didn't want to hear it. The American public turned sour on him so fast, it, it made your head spin. Um, he also thought very long and hard and in an agonizing way, night after night, about what to do about the hostages. Um, and he didn't make any quick fixes, and he didn't make any deals, and he didn't buy any little magic formulas or let anybody else run away with the power. He finally uh, did make the uh, a... Um, an honorable arrangement, freezing Iranian assets and, 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 and forcing a conclusion to that. He didn't get the credit for it because it was too late and the Iranians had really, in some mysterious way, manipulated that election, it almost seems, so that it, it, it was too late for him to, uh, to get credit for it. But in any case, uh, we have a model of one uh, leader who said, I'm going to level with you, I'm going to tell you, where, where, where it hurts and where I don't have the answers, nobody does, and we're going to have to work together on this. And uh, it was a total failure. He is now only slowly being redeemed. Um, but I think that's a, uh, that's a warning. Every political figure reads those tea leaves and says, uh-uh, not me. <laughs> exactly. And so it seemed to me that people who become president or take on authority need to learn how to pace the rate and how to be strategic in getting people to face uh, realities they'd rather not face, and I think that Carter was fairly sloppy in doing so, and paid for it. It's unfortunate, at least he tried. But I think also the media, the press, could have helped him. They could have paved the way. It shouldn't have been a shock for the president to be coming out with news like that. He shouldn't be the source of, uh, in your terms, um, unwanted medicine. It should be Uh, something people are already acclimated to through the interventions of numerous public organizations, including yours. You mentioned Bush's 
mother, who I presume is still alive, do you see any significance in the fact that both the caucus and Bush have mothers who are alive, influential, and very quite elderly, I think both in their 80s, if not 90s, does that affect their character? And would their character change if the mother died? <laughs> when the mother dies? Um, well, I, they are both uh, extremely strong figures, very strong and uh, important figures in the lives of their, of their sons. Uh, they both were the... Uh, <clears throat> in, in many ways, I think that, uh, that Dukakis' mother, Euterpe, sided with him and uh, was the spur to him, whereas his father was more of the um, uh, guide for his older brother, Stelian. Um, and Mrs. Dukakis told me that, in her view, Stelian was, uh, had a very high IQ, but he didn't have the focus, the intensity that Michael did. Michael could do everything, and she seems to have made her um, uh, common cause with Michael Dukakis. So, and she's still there, and she's still campaigning for him, and she's still out there, she's still very much part of his life. And, uh, uh, and I think having that strong woman on one side and then the other strong woman, Kitty Dukakis, that he married, who is really a, quite an, an opposite, who drags parts of himself out that weren't, weren't operative, um, I think those two women are the most important figures in his life and uh, uh, very important. George Bush also, his mother was the, was the one who's, who, uh, who got behind him and said, compete, compete, don't lose, win, You've got to win at everything. Uh, wouldn't uh, take, you know, uh, even, it had to be 6 love, not 6-2. Um, and although she is not particularly well at this time, she's still very much in his thoughts. And uh, he's, he will say, I'm not allowed to talk about my war uh, experiences. Now, he subsequently uh, got over that because they played very well. And uh, uh, but he will still say every once in a while, my mother doesn't let me talk about that. So she obviously still has a very operative effect on him. Final question here. Hi. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, when I was 16, I guess, Reagan was first running in 1980, and I bet a friend that uh, the American people weren't stupid enough to elect him, and I lost. But um, you have all implied tonight that the American public is sophisticated, and I, my I, question... I haven't. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, I think the American public uh, is made up of human beings, and all of us are predisposed to uh, avoiding pain and harsh realities, and we do the best that we can given what we've got and what we're up against. Okay, well, my question is to everyone, and it's, uh, do you really believe that, and, and if so, why? Uh, perhaps the uh, answer to the previous, one of the previous questions, we should have consulted Nancy Reagan's astrologer friend in San Francisco, uh, who might have quoted Shakespeare, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in the stars, but in ourselves, that we are their underlings. Well, you know, uh, we deserve what we get. I mean, I, I don't think that, uh, that the American... Uh, there's nothing more fraudulent I've heard in a long time of covering presidential politics than President Carter's uh, determination to give the American people a, a, a government as good and as decent as they are. And I said, yuck. I mean, that's, <laughs> I, mean I don't want to see that because uh, I would hope he could do better, you see. Right? And I, I, I don't, I, I think people are, they're not sophisticated. Don't forget, voting is a cult, practically. It's getting down to the 50% level in politics. We're, we're in a tiny minority here, you know. We might as well be uh, on cable television with an evangelist, you know. We, we have a, a, a dwindling, slim majority of people interested in civic affairs. And if you look at the, uh, at the demographics of the non-voters, it's not just some some ill-educated person in a trailer park. It's people with master's degrees who boast that they don't vote. So uh, I think, yeah, people get what they deserve and not much better. Um, I, I agree with you totally, Marty, that, that we get the leaders we deserve. Um, I do th think one of the interesting things is that 
because of television uh, and it, both its positive and negative effects, people are think they're much better informed. I mean, they've, they've just got the tip of a lot of different um, pieces of news. And there, there has been a fragmentation of value systems. So when people look at character, they look at the television set and they apply their own uh, value system to what they see as the values of the, of the candidate they're looking at. And so it all becomes very fragmented. And when the LA Times did a survey on uh, voter groups, they were hoping to come up with two or three kinds of voter groups. And they came up with nine different value systems. Um, all of whom, all of which think that they are the American value system. So every time I hear a candidate stand up and say, and I stand for the great American values, the fundamental values we all share, you say, which one, number two or number eight or number nine? They're, and each of those groups thinks that they have a lock on the value systems of the country. So it's, it's hard, actually, to talk about um, the lead in uh, anything less than a, a major book, uh, a, a really large work. But let me just say one, one uh, if, if this is to be the last question, I don't know, but I'd like to leave it on a positive note. Uh, some of the processes that go on during the electoral um, situation, during the, that, those last three months, or even during the year and a half that, of active campaigning, um, are much more important than who actually gets elected because there's an ongoing educative process that sometimes takes place, with, particularly with an unusual candidacy. And I'm thinking now of Jesse Jackson, who, for all of his shenanigans, and for all, he always is playing to two audiences, and he's got the core white audience of Americans who he effectively tries to uh, educate as to the needs of his people that have been ignored or uh, oppressed and he talks that oppression thing all the time. But when he talks to an all black group, and I've heard him do this many, many times, there is something quite different that comes out and something very special. And that is, he says, no, don't go by the pleasure principle. Don't do what's easy today. Don't escape. Don't go into drugs. Don't pretend it's all Whitey's fault. It starts with you. And he is unsparing with that message. And on top of that, he says, don't get angry, which is a different message than I think any major black politician has given his own flock for a long time. It's so much easier to get angry at the core society uh, for what has been denied. He's saying, don't get angry. Get your act together and go out there. If I can make it, you can make it. And if he gets that message out to uh, hundreds thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of black Americans, that could provide a change historically that's far more important than who gets elected in 1988. We'll close on that point. Uh, next uh, week, Monday through Thursday, on the big screen, we'll have the Republican Convention, for those of you who care to watch. Um, let's give our panel one more round of applause. For